Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Richard Weller. I'm the chair of the Landscape Architecture Program here at the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to this lecture series. Uh, the title of the series is From the Rooftops and we thought it was a good idea to get the faculty to lay down some online lectures to provide something interesting and stimulating for you as we get through this tricky period of COVID-19. The first speaker, I'm delighted to say, is our Dean, Frederick, as we know him, Fritz Steiner. Fritz is the Dean of the Weizmann School of Design at the University of Pennsylvania, and I think it's fair to say that across the course of his career, he has been a relentless champion of environmental values. Um, before his appointment as Dean at Penn, Fritz served as the Dean of the School of Architecture and the Henry M. Rockwell Chair in Architecture at the University of Texas for 15 years. Uh, Fritz has taught all over the world. Of course, he's spent time at Arizona State University, Washington State University, the University of Colorado at Denver. He was also for some years a visiting professor of landscape architecture at Tsinghua University in Beijing. He has been a Fulbright Hayes Scholar at uh, Wageningen University in the Netherlands and a Rome Prize Fellow in Historic Preservation at the Academy, the American Academy in Rome. Uh, notably and recently, he helped establish the Sustainable Sites Initiative. Uh, this was the first of its kind, a program to offer a systematic, comprehensive rating system designed to define sustainable land development and management. Um, Fritz holds a Master of Community Planning degree and a BS in, Sci in Design from the University of Cincinnati and of course his PhD from here at Penn and a Master of Regional Planning also from the University of Pennsylvania and Fritz has received an Honorary Master of Philosophy in Human Ecology from the College of the Atlantic. Fritz has hundreds of publications to his name uh, many related to the enduring legacy of Ian McCarg, with whom he shares a profound belief in the ability to improve the way we dwell on this earth. So with that, I welcome Fritz um, to this, our first lecture in the From the Rooftop series. Enjoy. Hello, um, I'm Frederick Steiner, but I go by Fritz. And I want to talk about the ecological underpinnings of design. And really, um, before we get, some of the underpinnings are really predate e the, the science of ecology. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how our views of the natural world uh, influence design. And by design, I, I mean it very broadly, design uh, as envisioning uh, new futures uh, from the site scale to uh, the, the continental and even global scale. So we'll begin with Thomas Jefferson, um, third president of the United States, known for many things like writing the Declaration of Independence. But for our purpose, um, he was responsible for a series of uh, ordinances called the Northwest Ordinances in the 18, or I'm sorry, in the 1780s. And essentially the Northwest Ordinances developed um, or put in place a system for settling uh, the Western United States. And it was essentially this uh, grid system of, of square mile uh, circles that were placed across um, from Ohio to Minnesota. And then the system was um, then used further west in the United States and also in Canada, in much of Canada. So you can fly over uh, much of uh, North America and look down and you see the design of uh, Thomas Jefferson. Um, they can also see that it really didn't respect too much uh, natural processes, except for the boundaries, the boundaries, the big uh, rivers, the Ohio and the Mississippi, as well as uh, the Great Lakes. It's also important to note um, that Jefferson, of course, had a very complex relationship with slavery. Um, he knew it was wrong, he was a slaveholder uh, but in the Northwest Ordinances, uh, slavery was prohibited, putting in place um, the, um, the expansion of the United States without slavery. John Wesley Powell uh, was also a fascinating individual. He 
Uh, this is uh, a party um, that he had organized to go down the Colorado River uh, through the Grand Canyon. And he had been um, a, an officer in the American Civil War in the Union Army, uh, lost one of his arms, uh, was a, a, a explorer, very instrumental in establishing the U.S. Geological Survey and also the ethnographic um, division of the Smithsonian Institution. And he, um, he Powell, um, really studied uh, Native American settlements uh, and also was uh, really impressed by Mormon settlements in Utah. And both the Native Americans and the Mormons uh, used uh, water, used uh, hydrologic systems to, um, to, to be as a basis of their settlement. So uh, Powell suggested that we abandon the Jeffersonian grid and that we settle the American West based on drainage basins and watersheds. And this is uh, the report that he made to um, the, uh, the Senate in 1890. Uh, the, the Senate didn't pursue this, although it, did, it would influence later uh, settlement in, in, in the West and, and, and continued ideas about uh, the American West, which we'll get to later in the presentation. The Transcendentalists were a group of mostly New England writers, and they, um, they used nature for the inspiration uh, of their, their writing. Um, probably the best known were Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and Emily Dickinson. And the Transcendentalists um, had a wide influence on how uh, we thought about um, the, the, the United States and how we thought about our relationship with nature. And it influenced a number of people, including um, Frederick L. Olmsted Sr. And Frederick L. Olmsted Sr. with his partner, Calvert Vox, um, were responsible, of course, for the design of Central Park in New York City. And Olmsted, um, he just um, 198 years ago was born in Hartford, Connecticut. And his partner in many projects was Calvert Vox, who was a, a, an architect originally from England. And among um, Olmsted's important protégés was Charles Eliot, who I'll uh, return to in a moment. And uh, Olmsted and Vox uh, did many plans for parks. They also uh, did this amazing plan for Riverside, Illinois, outside of Chicago. And you can see the settlement, the, their design is based on the flow of the river and then protecting areas near the river and near the, um, an adjacent stream for parkland. And then they used the, the natural topography uh, to lay out the, the road system. So it was a um, system, uh, a design based very much on an understanding of topography and uh, water flows. This one, uh, this is maybe a, a very stark example of um, how nature was re-envisioned. Uh, Niagara Falls um, before and after Olmsted. Of course, Olmsted did the plan for Niagara Falls. Um, and um, it, it's an uh, amazing transformation of a reinvented nature. Olmsted worked with Charles Eliot uh, from the 1870s into the 1890s on a plan for Boston. And it's called the Emerald Necklace. And the Emerald Necklace is uh, really a regional plan. And it um, certainly was about providing open space and recreation for people in Boston. But it also um, was about protecting uh, water quality and also managing uh, floods very successful, still uh, provides an incredible open space system uh, for the Boston, Boston region. And Elliot was the son of, um, his father's name was Charles Elliot as well. And Elliot's father was uh, the president of Harvard University, it was very important in Harvard's history. And Elliot would go to Mount Desert Island in Maine in the summer uh, with his classmates and also uh, science faculty from Harvard. And they spent a lot of times ma mapping uh, Mount Desert Island 
uh, its vegetation, its flora, its, its, its animals, its topography, its geology. It's what we would today call an ecological inventory. And uh, among uh, Olmsted's other protégés were the Olmsted brothers and uh, John C. and Frederick uh, Law Olmsted Jr. And they, um, uh, they continued uh, the work of their father after uh, he died in the early 20th century. Ebenezer Howard uh, was a British court reporter who was living in Chicago and was very influenced by uh, Riverside, Illinois. So when he returned to England, uh, he proposed this idea, the idea of a garden city. And so we get um, the ideas that Olmsted and uh, his uh, circle in uh, the United States and North America uh, began to influence uh, ideas about uh, development uh, in, um, in England and elsewhere in, in Europe. Here's an example of um, uh, one of the plans that developed from uh, Ebenezer Garden City idea uh, in England. And you can see here the, the importance of uh, vegetation uh, in the development of the plan and green space. So that's the idea of a garden city. Another person who I would argue grew out of the Transcendentalist movement was John Muir, um, 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 who was from Scotland, originally grew up in Wisconsin, was a bit of, um, a, well, certainly a visionary, a um, bit of a wild guy, loved uh, the natural world. And um, um, he's uh, in many ways the, the, the father of um, ideas like national parks and wilderness areas, that wilderness, there was value in wilderness. So he took Emerson and Thoreau and Dickinson's idea and uh, suggested uh, what now we would call state and national parks. So well, this sort of transcendental movement is, um, is happening, there, uh, the science of biology is, in, is um, advancing. Um, in Europe and not in the United States. Uh, Reclus was a French um, scientist who uh, also was an advocate of watershed or drainage basin planning, uh, but also the use of, of biological systems, understanding of biological systems in design and planning. And he would uh, have an influence on another Scot Scotsman, uh, Patrick Geddes. And Patrick Geddes was a uh, biologist um, and also a sociologist and became a town planner. And this is his transect, his valley section, where he started to look at uh, the landscape, look at um, elevation, and look at how p settlements were tied to the quality of the soil, the orientation of slopes, and so on. Uh, of course, this idea of a transect goes back even further in China. Uh, this um, a very famous Chinese scroll um, that looks um, at a, a section along a river during uh, a festival. And it's a beautiful rendition of life in China um, from over um, a thousand years ago. Another example of uh, precedent is the, the um, German uh, scientist Alexander von Humboldt, and this is one of the transects that he drew of the Andes to show the relationship of vegetation to elevation. So it gives it back to Patrick Geddes. Patrick Geddes was uh, very influenced by Charles Darwin, but he was his his professor. Geddes's professor was a man named Thomas Huxley, and Huxley's big idea he took uh, Darwin's ideas about evolution and argued that uh, species have um, a role in their own evolution. In fact, humans have a role in uh, our uh, evolution. Geddes then uh, argued that town planning and design were the instruments uh, that we use to participate in our own evolution. So we start to see more and more ideas from biology um, influencing uh, design and planning. 
This is um, a quote from Patrick Geddes. Uh, the environment acts through fu uh, function upon the organism, and conversely, the organism acts through function upon the environment. Among those influenced by um, Geddes were the American forester Benton Mackay and the American, uh, well, it's hard to describe exactly what Lewis Mumford was. He was a writer and his historian. Um, and Mumford and McKay uh, were part of a group of uh, American thinkers called the Regional Plan, uh, the Regional Planning Association of America. And they took Getty's ideas and uh, also those of Olmsted and um, suggested their use uh, in, in um, the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, Benton Mackay uh, proposed the Appalachian Trail uh, all along the Appalachian Mountains uh, as a way to revitalize that area, but also to provide a massive corridor from Maine into um, um, uh, Georgia. Um, and Mackay uh, also wrote regional planning in short as applied human ecology. And Mackay took um, Olmsted and Eliot's uh, emerald necklace idea and uh, uh, created something called the Boston Bay Circuit. So it's the, the, the next ring around Boston, uh, building on the inner ring created by the Emerald Necklace. And uh, Mackay used uh, transects, uh, these panorama of uh, the, uh, circ the Bay Circuit illustrates how he took Getty's ideas and, and the other ideas about transects and applied them to this large scale planning proposal. Also these ideas um, from, uh, from Mumford and Mackay and their colleagues were adopted during the New Deal of the 1930s, for example, uh, the use of the uh, large-scale river basin planning to uh, develop the Tennessee Valley Authority. And so we have this regionalism um, that also involved uh, resettlement, uh, new uh, towns for uh, settlement. It was meant to relieve poverty and create work but also to create um, uh, energy in, in the form of hydroelectric. And this brings us to uh, Ian McCark, who also used the transect. And um, he was um, a very much a protege of Lewis Mumford's. Uh, McCark so, um, also uh, sort of emerged at a time when um, we start to get an evil or a, a, biology taking, uh, beginning to be thought of as ecology or influencing or being part of ecology. Um, ecology means, uh, it's from the Greek word oikos, meaning uh, the house. And so more and more biologists started to turn their attention to ecosystems. Uh, among uh, three of the more important were Aldo Leopold, uh, the author of the Sand County Almanac, Paul Sears, who um, argued that ecology is really a subversive subject, and uh, Rachel Carson, who really showed that ecology was a subversive subject in her remarkable book, Silent Spring. And so we get um, with McCarg um, this, this evolution of uh, biology to ecology, again, very uh, Darwinian in its roots, but in McCarg's case, uh, influenced by a man named Lawrence Henderson, an ecologist and biologist named Lawrence Henderson. And there's uh, McCarg, another Scottish uh, person from Glasgow. And what uh, McCarg, where Gettys was interested in how people uh, were participating in their evolution, McCarg was interested in how uh, some environments were more fit than others. So he borrowed, I mean, Henderson uh, wrote this wonderful book called The Fitness of the Environment, um, influenced by Darwin. And then in, in turn, uh, McCarg uh, is influenced by uh, Henderson. So McCarg 
Uh, oh, here's a quote from Henderson. Um, Darwinian fitness is compounded of a mutual relationship between organisms and the environment. Of this fitness of the environment is quite essential, a quite essential component as the fitness which arises in the process of organic evolution. And in the fundamental characteristics, the actual environment is the fittest abode of life. And McCarg organized um, uh, thought uh, he he organized uh, the the environment in what he called the layer cake, and the layer cake takes the various aspects of the environment, the various layers of the environment from the various sciences, and he organized them in um, chronological order from the oldest parts of the environment to the more ephemeral parts of the environment. And this uh, on the left is uh, his layer cake image from the Woodlands report uh, from the early 1970s that he did for a new town outside of Houston, Texas called the Woodlands. Uh, on the right is I sort of redrew it so it really looks like a cake. And of course, this is the uh, basis of what we now call GIS or Geographic Information System. Um, and you see these when you're learning GIS, these layers, but seldom do they have the sort of artfulness and thoroughness that uh, McCarg brought to um, the idea of layering information. And also, uh, McCarg used ecology to unify these layers, uh, which is missing from many contemporary GIS systems. So, uh, at, McCarg uh, was very active in many uh, plans, including one in the 1960s, 60s uh, for the Washington, D.C. area that he did with his, his um, company called Wallace, McCarg, Roberts, and Todd, which today exists as WRT, uh, also the American Institute of Architects and the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he also was involved in uh, the Delaware River uh, Valley, uh, just to give us you an idea of the scale of maps that they were producing. Uh, assuming each of these fellows is about six foot tall, we've got 12 foot tall maps of uh, the Delaware River Valley. He was also involved in uh, the planning for the Twin Cities, another map uh, that was done for uh, the metropolitan area of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul. Excuse me, I jumped a couple here. Uh, also, the Denver Front Range. Uh, this is a report from the early 70s. McCard worked, uh, one of his um, partners in many of the efforts is this is a man in the middle of this picture named Narendra Janesha. Narendra was uh, a landscape architect, uh, originally an architect from India, and he came, studied at Penn. Uh, worked with McCarg both here at the University of Pennsylvania, but also with Wallace, McCarg, Roberts, and Todd. Uh, between uh, McCarg is on the right there with the beard, and uh, Narendra is uh, Pauline McCarg, is McCarg's first wife, who was from the Netherlands and uh, sadly died of cancer uh, in the early 70s. And, 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 and unfortunately, Narendra was taken too early too. But Narendra was um, very instrumental in many of McCarg's projects, and, uh, including an ecological planning study for Medford, New Jersey. And the Medford report uh, and plan influenced uh, quite a few others, including the, the plan for the New Jersey Pinelands, seen here, uh, undertaken by many uh, former McCarg students uh, for the uh, state of New Jersey. And McCarg himself was involved uh, globally, uh, including um, the plan for the new capital of Nigeria, Abuja. And Abuja, you can see, uh, this is Abuja today, and the plan that was drawn in 1975. And there's uh, quite uh, obvious influence of uh, natural process in the layout and, and development of this new city. Um, just a, a note about McCarg's uh, sort of influence and how the ideas are still relevant. 
Uh, on the upper left-hand side is a, 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 a map of um, Staten Island in New York, which McCarg did in the um, mid-1960s and was published in his book, Design with Nature, in 1969. And then below, there's areas that he suggested were good for uh, urbanization, and then a composite plan. In the upper right is the um, what the, the area that was most impacted by uh, Hurricane uh, Sandy. And so you see these areas that were impacted most by Hurricane Sandy were exactly the areas that McCarg uh, suggested that were the most unsuitable. And here we have, um, I try to also note that there's other trends in the world going on that are influencing our ideas about ecology, including human, or the ecology of people. Uh, very important in this regard is the Annal School in, in, um, in France, uh, looking at the relationship of everyday life and settlement to natural processes. So um, many of McCarg students uh, had, would go on to have um, influential careers in uh, landscape architecture, architecture, and, and planning. Among them is Anne Winston Spurn, uh, who's now at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And she wrote this uh, really um, prescient book and was published in 1984 called The Granite Garden. And she basically argued that McCarg's ideas uh, about uh, nature and using ecology and design and planning were very, very applicable to cities. And she was joined by another uh, McCarg protege, Michael Huff, um, originally from England. And he also, in the same year as, as Anne Spurn, uh, published this book called City Form and Natural Processes. So uh, McCarg students uh, furthered his ideas about nature and design and the use of ecology in uh, design. Um, as uh, at this around the same well, at the same time that Spurn and Huff were publishing their book, uh, Richard Foreman, who spent most of his career uh, first at Rutgers, but then many important years at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Of course, he's a, um, a Penn PhD, a proud Penn PhD, uh, and uh, Richard published his important book on landscape ecology in 1984. And um, among Foreman's many other books is, the, um, is this book, Urban Ecology, uh, which was published in 2014. And the new ecologist, uh, what I call the new ecologist, um, the new urban ecologist, um, really um, two of the more important centers of current urban uh, ecological uh, uh, study are in uh, central Arizona and in Baltimore. And in the, in the mid-1990s, the National Science Foundation, which funds these things called long-term ecological research programs, uh, most of the LTRs are out in the middle of national parks or wilderness areas, but ecologists argued we really should have a couple of those, uh, some of these in, in our urban areas. So uh, Central Arizona and Baltimore were chosen because they're very different kinds of cities. And um, they've been studying, they, the scientists involved in these two LTRs have been studying and advancing urban ecology ever since. Uh, Stuart Pickett uh, from the Cary Institute of Urban, uh, uh, the Cary Institute of Ecosystem Studies, uh, is especially, he was a leader of the Baltimore study and um, one of the books that he and his colleagues have published about urban ecology is the Baltimore School of Urban Ecology, uh, published by the Yale University Press in 2015. And the leader of the Arizona Project is the ecologist Nancy Grimm, and um, she uh, has led the uh, study of uh, the urban ecosystems in the Phoenix metropolitan area. So let's look a little bit. There's also um, groups of artists that have looked at the role of nature in their art. 
Uh, one of my favorites is Robert Smithson. Who, this is his Spiral Jetty in the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Uh, but there are other artists that were, um, that are other landscape architects who were in, influenced by uh, minimalism, including uh, Martha Schwartz. And they were arguing that maybe the ideas about ecological design had gone too far and it stifled creativity. And so they were, um, they were suggesting uh, other uh, ways of expressing um, uh, designing landscapes and, and based more on art than on nature. Uh, this is another project from about that same area, uh, era of time by George Hargraves, uh, Harlequin Plaza in um, outside of Denver, clearly devoid of nature. And it was really Jim Corner here at Penn uh, and Lisa Switkin and others who started to merge the ideas about art um, uh, with ideas about ecology. And uh, one of their best known projects, of course, is the High Line. Uh, Corner at the time was the chair of our Department of Landscape Architecture and Regional Planning. And uh, he uh, and a small group of People founded James Corner Field Operations. And th another of their really important projects is the Fresh Kills Park uh, on Staten Island, um, a huge landfill. Some others that have been involved in, in sort of merging art and ecology is uh, Susanna Drake of D-Land Studio. Uh, this is her plan for the Guamas Canal in Brooklyn called Sponge Park, a uh, heroic attempt to uh, re-envision one of the most polluted sites uh, in North America. Uh, another uh, important person is uh, Kate Orff. Uh, by the way, uh, Susanna still practices in New York, but also teaches now at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And Kate, uh, her firm is uh, SCAPE. And here's her idea of what she called oyster texture, of redeveloping or reestablishing the oyster um, habitats in New, in New York Harbor. I put Kenneth Frampton in. He's an, uh, arch, an architect because there were similar ideas um, that were influencing um, architecture um, and about really looking at regions as a basis for design. And probably the most important of this group was, was Kenneth Frampton. So, um, Beginning uh, in the late uh, 20th century, um, a, a group of uh, designers and planners started to uh, advance ideas about regionalism, often based on ecology. Uh, John Fraganese, the planner, and, and, and Peter Calthorpe, uh, a Berkeley uh, area, um, a Berkeley uh, uh, architect and planner, uh, were in, uh, they did a number of regional plans and that had great impact and, and shaping uh, a number of regions around the United States, including um, their plan called Envision Utah in Utah. Another uh, new regionalist is Carl Steinitz uh, from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. And he uh, worked with uh, Richard Foreman and others for this plan of Camp Pendleton uh, in Southern California, sort of taking this marine base and uh, looking at how it could be used uh, for wildlife um, enhancement and biodiversity. So many, one of the ideas that has come out of uh, urban ecology and landscape ecology and current ecological thinking is the idea of ecosystem services. And ecosystem services is basically a natural uh, benefits that uh, we take for granted and um, advocates of regional of ecosystem services um, explain them as supporting services uh, that is the um, those that are necessary for the production of all other ecosystem services nutrient cycling primary production soil formation so on uh, they also describe provisioning services that uh, decry that uh, describe the material or energy outputs of ecosystems, such as food, water, and other resources. 
uh, regulating uh, services, uh, the services of, uh, that, are, that ecosystems provide as regulators, uh, regulating the air quality, uh, the soil quality, uh, by uh, providing flood and disease control. And then um, a cultural service, or what I uh, sometimes call the contributing services, is um, those non-material benefits that uh, are important for uh, human culture. So these are some examples of ecosystem services. Um, and we, um, and also ecosystem services uh, can occur everywhere. They, can, they occur in urban areas, they occur in mountain areas. So we should think of um, ecosystem services as an opportunity to um, understand when we design uh, and plan places. We uh, use this for the creation of the Sustainable Sites Initiative. It's a project I worked on from 2005 to 2015. Uh, with the Lady Bird Johnson Wildfire Center in Austin, as well as the U.S. Botanic Garden and the American Society of Landscape Architects. If you're familiar with the U.S. Green Building Council's LEED standards, uh, site standards are essentially LEED for the outdoors, and we based it very much on ecosystem services. Um, one example of um, the application of e uh, ecosystem services and the Sustainable Sites Initiative is uh, this project done by Andrew Pogon and others in Pittsburgh, uh, the fifth center for sustainable landscapes. Uh, it's achieved not only the highest standard of uh, ranking from the site system, but also LEED and also the Living Building Challenge and Well Building Challenge. Another example of sort of the bringing together ecology and regionalism, uh, what I call the new ecological regionalists. One is our own Richard Weller, and uh, he did this wonderful uh, project uh, for um, Perth uh, in Australia, in Western Australia. Uh, and here he borrows from uh, Patrick Geddes and looking at the future of Perth if it was uh, done uh, using um, Gettys, as I, I'm sorry, not Gettys, uh, uh, Ebenezer Howard. Uh, this is Ebenezer Howard's idea of uh, garden cities, not, not uh, Patrick Gettys, but e Ebenezer Howard. And uh, Weller, of course, is also uh, advocated uh, a new uh, park for the world um, and based on ecology and where the places in the world are both urbanizing and threatening biodiversity and are threatened by climate change and how to use a uh, world park to uh, create a different future for those places. Another example of a new ecological regionalist is Kung Jung Yu uh, from Turnscape and Peking University, influenced by people like people like Richard Foreman and Carl Steinitz and Richard, Richard Foreman Carl Steinitz and Ian McCarg, he's proposed a new uh, a system of ecological security for the People's Republic of China. So these ideas of, of looking at national scale or even continental scale, um, are, and in Richard Weller's case, global scale, um, are important. Another pair are uh, Laurel McSherry of Morgan State University and Rob Holmes of Auburn University. And they proposed, they won a competition in 2012 called the Arid Lands Competition. And you can see this is very much uh, influenced by um, John Wesley Powell and Powell's um, ideas about um, the Arid Lands of the West, but McSherry and Holmes took it to the whole United States and basically argued we should reorganize the United States based on drainage basins. And they even worked out a way to regovern uh, the uh, United States based uh, on uh, what they called uh, a Commonwealth approach to um, the, uh, the United States. Uh, McSherry also uh, sort of reinterpreted re uh, transects. This is what she called dual transects, which is a trans the transect of both the Clyde River. Valley in Scotland, 
and our own Delaware Valley, and each of these bars represents a river crossing. Uh, so it's a, a, a new way of looking at uh, an older tool. So a lot of our efforts um, in design, uh, most licensing in the United States and much of the world uh, for landscape architects or architects is based on the protection of public health, safety, and welfare. Um, this is sort of the evolution of the World Health Organization's definition of health. And essentially, it's um, health is our ability uh, to recover from injury and insult. And obviously, then, it's related to resilience. Pope, Pope Francis, has taken on this idea, uh, and he talks about in his um, um, encyclical letter about the future of the planet, uh, his ideas about human ecology, ecology, and what he calls integral ecology, and his um, advocacy of taking care of uh, the planet. So the Pope uh, identified climate as a common good and at, uh, at the root, uh, human roots of the ecological uh, crisis. Furthermore, he advocated for an integral ecology as an appropriate response. And according to Pope Francis, human ecology is inseparable from the notion of the common good a central and unifying principle of social ethics. The book that we published last year in um, uh, commemoration of the 50th uh, anniversary of McClarg's Design with Nature, Design with Nature Now. And we take uh, 25 projects from around the world and show how uh, ideas about nature and ideas about ecology are very relevant to design and planning. So McCarg declared in 1961, it is now time to examine the city as an ecosystem. And uh, that message could never, could not be more relevant today than it was uh, over 50 years ago. So thank you. And that's my presentation.